Hey there, Mr. Redder here. Welcome back to another episode of r slash Entitled People Stories. Our first story we'll be reading today. My mother is demanding I adopt my niece and nephew. After that, am I the jerk for making a joke about my brother's affair at his wedding? And after that, don't want to work on our assignment? Fine, neither do I. Now for every thumbs up this video gets, one Karen does not get to force anyone to adopt. Oh, I have my ways, Reddit boy. So please smash that like button and subscribe and turn on notifications for new stories from Reddit every single day. My mother is demanding I adopt my niece and nephew. Myself, 26, and my partner, 32, are child free and wish to remain so. Both of our families know this. Recently, my partner's brother and sister-in-law passed in an accident, leaving their son who's 12 and their daughter who's nine behind. My partner's parents have been watching them for months but they cannot do this full time as they are both in their 70s and have bad health. My partner's sister has also declined adopting the pair as she and her husband are both paramedics and work evenings and weekends. Naturally, they came to us next and after weeks of discussion, my partner and I decided that we would not adopt them. We both know that we would make terrible guardians, which is the main reason we have decided to be child free. My partner's family are understandably upset that nobody can take the kids but they will now be adopted by family on their mother's side. This means they'll be a few hours drive from all of us. It's important to note here that my in-laws have been incredibly kind during this process, have not pressured us at all and accepted immediately that we would not adopt them. My mother, on the other hand, has been on my back saying I'm making a horrible decision and that I need to put the needs of the kids above my own. She has also been mentioning that my partner and I will finally have kids despite me telling her that that is absolutely not the case. She has always resented the fact that I'm child free and wish to remain so, and I'm worried that she's seen the kids as a way of becoming a grandmother. I feel terrible that we aren't adopting them, and I certainly feel like a jerk because of it, but it just wouldn't work out in the long run. I need to know, am I the jerk? Edit. Just for clarification, the kids will be going to their second cousin's house, who they are close with. They're not going into the system. Not the jerk. The kids are going to guardians who want them. It would be bad for them to be with someone who resented them, even more so if they were there because your mother wants grandbabies. Not the jerk. Your mother is not thinking about those kids' needs. She's thinking, yay, now I get grandkids and this will make them want more. Those kids are not going into the system. They're going to family who are capable of raising them. You and your partner knew that you weren't able to do the job of raising them and have made the right decision for those kids. Don't let anybody tell you differently. Am I the jerk for making a joke about my brother's affair at his wedding? When I was in elementary school, I was the type of kid who got disrupts class often on their report card, so I never focused much on school. My district had this system where they would pair high schoolers with younger kids to help them with school, etc. And my mom made me do that after I kept getting in trouble. So my tutor was a freshman, Abby. She would come to our house after school to help me with my homework or something, I barely remember. My brother, John, was the same age as Abby, so they would talk to each other and ended up dating. She stopped tutoring me officially after like a month, but since she was at our house a lot, I also talked to Abby a lot and we were close as well. Fast forward 10 years, Abby and John got married and had a kid together. Five years later, John tells me that he's getting a divorce because he's met someone new. It sucked because I liked John and Abby together a lot, but whatever. Then he tells me he had had an affair with his new girlfriend. Also sucks, and I told him he shouldn't have hurt Abby like that, but whatever. I also asked Abby how she was doing, and she wasn't doing well, but she told me she didn't want her to be the reason I have a bad relationship with my brother. However, two months before the wedding, Abby calls me and tells me that my brother's girlfriend has been harassing her nonstop. She showed me the texts, and his girlfriend was saying some pretty disturbing things about how she's so much better than Abby, taunting Abby for having to share custody of her kid now, etc., just making fun of her and bullying her. I told my brother about this, and he said he would ask his girlfriend about it. A month later, I asked him if he ever brought it up, and he said he did, but saw nothing wrong with the texts, which upset me. I confirmed that he saw the same texts I saw. Abby apologized for involving me in the whole thing in the first place and encouraged me to still go to the wedding, where my brother asked me to make a speech. The speech went well until I made a joke. The gist of the joke was me turning to his new wife and telling her that if she's learned anything from this, 
she should know that my brother will never let his wife stop him from finding the love of his life. This got my brother and his wife really mad and they kicked me out shortly after and my brother has been calling and texting me non-stop yelling at me. Am I the jerk? You know how vigilantes are technically in the wrong, but we all cheer them on anyway? You're the jerk, but high five. I read the title and thought, really, you're not sure? And then laughed at the joke. So maybe we're all jerks. I think there's a fine line between the jerk and the crapster. They're closely related, but I think they're both their own distinct subspecies. My personal theory is after a normal individual's many interactions with a jerk, there is some sort of DNA mutation which changes the regular individual into a crapster. Well, what do you think? Was OP the jerk or not? Please let us know. They're sure not a liar, I know that much. Don't want to work on our assignment? Fine, neither do I. This happened a few years ago in college. I had a class about entrepreneur projects, and that semester was building a business on paper. Basically, we had to figure out what the business would be about, how it would work, and how much money it would need and make. I did this subject in a different class so I could have Fridays free, so I didn't know anyone in there except for one guy. Let's call him Mark. So I teamed up with Mark and three other leftover people to be in our group. At first, things were working like a charm, since we only cared about passing the subject and didn't care about our grades. We would each do a part on an assignment. We had to deliver assignments each Wednesday but we still got max scores on them. Our grade would basically be based upon all of our deliveries, plus some points on individual tests. Important info for later. Didn't take much time for things to go downhill. It reached a point on the project that basically we couldn't modulate the work anymore. The five of us would need to sit together and brainstorm about the next steps, more specifically when we reached the point of how we would earn money with our business. Either that or one person would do everything alone. My group chose the second option, and this would basically be happening for six weeks. On Friday, I would send a message on our WhatsApp group like, Guys, we have to deliver this stuff on Wednesday. When do you want to meet? Saturday, no responses. Sunday, the two checks would turn blue, meaning everyone read the message. No response. Monday, I would send a follow-up message. No response. Tuesday, I would work hard and deliver it alone. Wednesday, two hours before the deadline, someone, usually Mark, would send a message. Hey, how do you guys want to do it? Which I would answer, it's already done. And they would thank me and promise to release me from doing anything on the next assignment, which wouldn't happen and the cycle would continue. After five weeks, I was fed up and got in contact with the teacher. Her response was that it was too late to do anything now because she couldn't assign me to another group and she couldn't give me special treatment. But she told me to check my grades because most likely I already passed the subject. I looked on it and with my individual tests plus what I had already delivered on the project, I got a grade high enough to barely pass the subject. This was kind of messed up, but all the individual tests and project as well, grades were public. So I saw that no one in my group had passed. The closest one was Mark, but he didn't deliver one of the individual tests, so he would still need to do something to pass. I could, then and there, be the bigger person and say something like, Guys, I already passed the subject. Start doing something or I won't do anything anymore. But I can be petty sometimes. On the sixth week, I didn't do anything. Wednesday arrived and Mark tagged me in the group asking if I did anything. I remained silent. Panic started arising. Group members texting me in private. I removed the blue scene icon in my WhatsApp and would read the messages in airplane mode so they wouldn't see me online when reading. Except for the group messages, because they would see that I read them regardless of leaving that setting on or off, so I didn't read them. Apparently, when you don't do anything related to the project in five weeks, it's hard to figure out what to do next. Deadline passes, I go to sleep. Class was at nights, at distance because of lockdown. Wake up the next day, several name callings, assignment not delivered and the group threatening to report me to the teacher. My answer was simple. Teacher is already aware. I'm not doing anyone's work other than mine. You can all buzz off. And left the group. At the end of the semester, only Mark and I passed. They got their crap together in the end, but not enough for the other deadweights to pass. Was the sweetest six. Grades here go from zero to ten. Six is the bare minimum to pass. I ever got. Mark never talked to me again, but it was for the best. Edit. Just had a sad realization. Lockdown happened a few years ago already. This was in the first semester of 2020. Dang, I have not enjoyed the last two years of my life. 
Edit 2. I should have mentioned that it was a private college, and those deadweights had to redo the subject. So, not only did they waste a lot of time, if you didn't pass the subject, there was another one in the next semester that you couldn't do. You also had to pay for it. This happened to me, except it was in med school. My identical twin sister was also in med school with me, and she was assigned to my group. Huge relief. Super easy, as we didn't have to check each other's work, as well as three others. Three-month project. At first, it went well. There was a lot of synergy and participation. By month two, however, that's when participation, as well as contributions from the remaining group members started to wane. We both contacted our professors, Dr. C and Dr. H, and we had a private meeting where they hypothetically gave us advice. However, another two weeks later, it became so apparent that our group members didn't care about the project anymore and expected us to do it all. So we had another meeting and changed the groups. My sister and myself, and them. They were not informed, and if they were, they obviously didn't read the memos from Dr. C and Dr. H. Honestly, they don't know and didn't care at this point. Come presentations, we got up, as well as our group members, who were then instructed to sit down, as it was not their presentation anymore. They all failed. We passed with flying colors. Are you a fan of group projects, or do you hate them? Please let us know. I could never stand group projects. Ugh. Mother-in-law doesn't know when to quit. My mother-in-law and I don't get along well. I've tried for the sake of my husband, but this last incident was the end of the line for me. My mother-in-law has always had this overprotective aspect about her when it came to her kids, which has significantly grown worse with time. Her reasoning behind this behavior is because she felt her mother always took the side of her significant other, and so she vowed to only care about her kids and not their partners. That didn't bother me initially. I figured if I was on her good side, nothing would be to worry about. Until you realize, this woman doesn't have a good side. She would say rude comments to all her kids' significant others. She would always gossip about my sister-in-law's boyfriend, saying he was a drunk and always took her daughter's money. Even though her daughter didn't have a job and the boyfriend would be the one paying for the apartment her daughter lived in and all of her clothes and food. She hated my brother-in-law's now ex-girlfriend. I have no doubt in my mind that my mother-in-law is part of the reason why they ended up breaking up. I never once saw my brother-in-law stand up to his mom regarding any rude comments she ever said about his girlfriend. He would simply turn away and ask everyone else to handle her. Like, really, dude? I never understood her thought process because the things that she would come up with would be outright delusional. It was only a matter of time before that crazy would make its way towards me, and boy, did it. When we were at her house, she blew up one night because I wasn't doing anything. I didn't help clean up or anything, but neither did anyone else. Apparently, I needed to clean off the dinner table and wash the dishes for seven people while at her house. Even my brother-in-law agreed. Even though he will literally sit on his phone the entire time while everyone else does prep work or cleans. So the next night I did it, even though my husband protested against it because I was a guest at her house. She would be in these weird moods where she wouldn't even acknowledge me when we came over. She just went straight to hugging my husband and saying how much she missed him while giving me a who's this jerk look. My husband would sometimes force me to initiate a hello and hug, but it came to the point where it was like, why should I when she doesn't like me? It started to get worse when I did something. Even while at my own home, mind you, she would flip out and start yelling and all of them would need to calm her down. When she would be at our house, she apparently would expect to be treated with the utmost respect, which is where my petty self came back with a no. You do not get to be disrespectful or callous to me in my own home. The icing on the cake is when my mom was with us and we stopped by to say goodbye before heading out. She was talking to my mom, asking my mother all of these weird questions about her name and everything. She took pictures with my mom and then she looked at me and then snapped. She started going off about how I'm the reason her family has so many problems. She's been through so much because she hasn't been able to see her son for so long. I was in utter shock. I didn't know what to say. I was simply looking at my husband like, what is going on? Then she gets up in my mother's face asking her a bunch of questions about why we got married, telling my mom that I take away money from my husband and that I'm a bad person. My mother didn't say a word but my heart sank when she started to cry because my mom had gone through so much with a vindictive mother-in-law for her 35 years of marriage to my dad. My husband defended me and my mom, even with my mother-in-law screaming at me that she was going to call the police on me and put me in jail. 
He tried to talk to his mom about her behavior and that it was unacceptable, but she refuses to apologize and believes she did no wrong. Her whole reasoning for snapping like that is because her friend told her that women will sometimes marry men to take their benefits. She does not think my mother is my real mom and that she is helping me in the process of using my husband. At this point, I'm convinced my mother-in-law belongs in an institution. My brother-in-law and sister-in-law believe that my mother-in-law did no wrong and that she had every right to behave this way. They keep telling my husband that this is your family and that he should put them first before me. I told my husband that because of how disrespectful she was, I do not want her at our house anymore. If he would like to go spend time with his family, he can freely do so by going to visit them. Is it wrong of me for being tired of being treated like I'm disposable to my in-laws? For asking for something as simple as common decency? I've never acted out or caused a scene in front of them. I've done so much for these people and they don't see it. Till this day, I'm still excluded from the family circle because I refuse to stand for this when behavior is rude and condescending. You are not wrong in this. She and your brother-in-law and sister-in-law are for defending her. They're disgusting people with atrocious behavior. I don't know how you lasted this long without kicking her out. Please stand your ground so that she's not allowed in your home and cut all contact. You're absolutely right. If he wants to see them, he can go on his own. You do not deserve to be treated like this in any manner, but especially not in your own home. Your poor mom. How much water do you want exactly? I deliver bulk water to people who don't have access to city water or their own private well. For nearly all customers, it's a simple process. Either they call for deliveries or they have agreed to automatic deliveries. When I show up, I hook the truck up to the fill pump and start pumping and either listen at the vent or hook up to an installed alarm in order to know when the holding tank is full. This particular customer had their holding tank installed in a small utility room next to their living room and didn't install a vent to the outside and refused to allow us to install an alarm because they didn't want us to put the 1 4th inch hole in the wall to run the alarm wire. Solution? They call when they need 2,000 gallons of water and we show up and pump exactly 2,000 gallons of water. This procedure worked without a flaw for over a decade. Literally hundreds of deliveries with no issue. Q owner deciding to sell. We're contacted by the new owners and set them up as a new account and head over for our first delivery and meeting. We especially go over the issue with us being totally unable to tell them when the tank is full. We offered to install the alarm again for free, but they declined. So we let them know when they call for water, they must be sure they have enough room in the tank for 2,000 gallons, or to let us know how much water they have room for. We went over this several times, and they laughed, saying they understood and would be calling when they were below the 2,000 gallon mark. Two weeks go by, and we receive a message on our answering machine from the new customer. No gallon amount is specified. This set off a warning bell though, because it was a household of two, and it's only been two weeks since we filled them last. That's highly abnormal. We expected more like five weeks. So we call back just to double check. No answer, so we leave a message asking for confirmation. Couple hours later, we try again. By the next day, we had left four messages asking to confirm that they were ready for a full load. No reply. Well, they did call, so boss sends me out. I knock on the door as a last attempt, still no answer. So I hook up, start the pump, and set the timer so I don't over pump while reading my book. 15 minutes later, I hop out to check on the water meter. 1700 gallons. I'll watch for the next couple minutes and shut it down. That's when I hear the front door burst open and the woman who bought the house and had called us in yesterday is screaming to shut the water down. There's water everywhere. What are we doing? This woman has been ignoring our calls and even ignored me at her door, and now she's screaming at me. Apparently, she had called when the tank was half full instead of down below the mark, showing where the 2,000 gallons is, and just disregarded all our messages and didn't feel like talking to me when I knocked. So now she has 700 plus gallons of water in her living room. Boss was called out so she could scream at him. Husband came home from work so he too could scream at us for reasons, I guess. They made a lot of demands about how we were going to pay to fix it. Nope. Boss laid down how we saw the situation. You can keep the water free of charge, just don't call us for water anymore. Y'all are too stupid to work with. Never heard from them again. I mean, it's a bit weird that you just continued to go out even after leaving multiple messages with no reply. This really does seem like you or your company's fault, 
like you just wanted to trash their house because they didn't reply to you. Remember, this isn't the Culligan guy. This is a tanker of water driving to rural areas. The protocol described exists so as to not waste anyone's time. Due to the incredibly tedious nature of the job, the call was placed and after that human intervention is the only way to stop the delivery. You want to live in an area where you live out of tanks? You have to be a certain level of responsible to do it. It's really that simple. Well, whose fault do you think it is? The company or the customers? Please let us know. Am I the jerk for making a thing because a bartender showed my ID to random customers? I went out the past weekend with two friends. I'm 29, but I have a baby face, so I still get carded regularly. I'm used to that and have no issues. Well, we went to a sports bar slash restaurant place, and the bartender, Trent, carded me. No big deal. Then some random guy was sitting a few seats away and said, How old is she? Trent said, Well, she was born in 92, so 29. I was holding out my hand expecting to get it back because I thought he was done. Random guy said, No way, let me see. And Trent walked over and handed him my license. I said, Um, excuse me, can I have my license back? Bartender said, Yeah, just a sec. Then the guy next to random guy took it and looked at it. When Trent finally gave it back, I sarcastically said, Thanks for passing my personal information around. My friend Lily that knows Trent said, They were just messing around, calm down. So I didn't say anything else about it till we were on our way home. I said, I can't believe you're friends with that tool. Lily said, He was just kidding around, you need to lighten up. And apparently, him and Billy and Rob are friends. If it was something that just had my age, I wouldn't care. But my license, like everyone's, has my first name, last name, address, and I don't know Billy and Rob from a hole in the wall. When I told my boyfriend, he laughed and said, they were probably trying to flirt, and I should have just let it go. That my past is causing me to be paranoid, because I had a coworker borderline stalking me a few years ago. Luckily, he didn't know where I lived, but he had to show up randomly when I was in public a lot. I'm sure if he knew where I lived, he'd have shown up there too. It bothered me Sunday and Monday. I could easily not go back there and probably won't, but my thinking is, if he's passing around my ID, he's doing it to other people. I called the place yesterday and asked to talk to a manager and said what happened. Lily called and yelled at me earlier. She said that they were just messing around, it wasn't serious enough for you to call and get him in trouble, that I embarrassed her by acting like an uptight jerk and making a big thing over a joke. Maybe they are harmless and it was probably just a joke, but it's more the principle of it. Am I the jerk? Should I have just let it go? Not the jerk. You didn't agree to the bartender passing around your ID to begin with. That is private information and the fact that your so-called friends and boyfriend are defending it is BS. You expressed how uncomfortable you were with that and nobody seemed to stop and really think about how the joke isn't funny and you didn't appreciate it. I feel like if I was OP, I would be like, yeah, you are right. Let me see your ID real quick. Oh, random stranger that my friend doesn't know? You want to see my friend's ID with her state identification number? Used to verify checks sometimes. And her address so you can possibly show up randomly? Then hand it right back to her. Not the jerk. If your license works like it does in my country, it has your address on it. Contact the owner and tell them what their employee is doing. It's unsafe and I'm not sure if it's even legal. Anybody who sees it could in theory turn up at your house. Trent is stupid. Not okay, not ever. Am I the jerk for being excited about finally getting into the same college my sister left? I, 22 female, have a problem and while I'm trying to be empathic to my sister, Mandy, who's 20, I can't help but feel angry and resentful so I wanted to come here for an outside perspective and discuss this with, hopefully, unbiased outsiders. When I was in middle school, my parents thought that it would be a good idea for me to visit an older cousin, Jen, 28 female, that I was close to at her college campus. I was excited to see her again, so I agreed and fell in love with the school she went to. It was going to be my goal to go to that college and I studied hard while working a part-time job to help save for tuition. I was so excited when I applied because I was so confident that I would get in and was crushed when I was waitlisted, then rejected. I locked myself in my room and cried for a few days because I was so focused on this one school, I didn't prepare myself for a future that didn't include it. Fortunately, Jen was kind enough to visit, allowed me to whine about my disappointment, talked about community college and gave me the pep talk I needed. 
I took a year off to just work and then went to a really nice community and during that time Mandy applied and was accepted into my dream school. Apparently she fell in love with it too and while she was smart enough to apply for other schools, the one Jin went to was her first choice. I'm not gonna lie, a part of me twinged inside knowing that my sister got into all the schools she applied for and I really started to feel negative about myself. But I worked to keep it to myself and even helped pay for some textbooks. Despite being upset with myself, I was still really happy for Mandy. Her first semester, she opted to do it remotely because of lockdown, but in the spring, she moved into the dorms, and when we would talk, she seemed happy. Then one day, she came home early and apparently wasn't going back. I didn't ask why, because it seemed like a sore subject. Then I applied, got in, and managed to get a partial scholarship and was overjoyed. I had to take an alternate path to get there, but I was finally going to be able to go to my dream school, and since I did all my gen eds at my community college, I was going to have very little debt. I have been over the moon, but recently Mandy exploded at me for bragging. I still don't know all the details, but apparently Mandy was kicked out, and she thinks I'm cruel for not only applying to her school, but making posts about it on social media and telling everyone in the family because it's drawing attention to her situation. I'm more than happy to tone it down, but our mom thinks that me getting in is reward enough to just stop talking about it, like at all. No social media posts, mentioning my school life to family, and to not even say the name of the school in the house. But I don't think that's very fair, because when I was upset about not getting in, I didn't tell Mandy to be quiet about her joy. Am I the jerk? Not the jerk. Seems like they did not have the same rule for your sister when she got into your dream school. Too often, the kid that whines and complains the loudest gets catered to, and the one that tries to be the bigger person is relegated to that role permanently. Mom, when Mandy got into this school, I did not expect her to hide her joy or keep quiet about her life to protect my feelings, and you didn't ask her to do that either. Back then, her joy was considered more important than my disappointment, and now that the tables are turned, her disappointment is more important than my joy. Can you please explain why my feelings, good and bad, always take backseat to hers? Karen fired me wrongfully, so I ended her company. Hey everyone, I decided to share my story. It all took place 17 years ago, but I feel like it belongs here. At that time, I was 20 years old and dated my first true love. We had been together for one and a half years already, and everything was great. Her mother really liked me, and she had her own company, which traded fashion clothes for kids. She made a ton of money. They needed someone to drive one of their three five-ton trucks, and she came up to me with the idea to hire me because I was unhappy with the job that I had. So as a win-win situation, I accepted her offer and we started working together. Job was okay, even though I had to work a huge amount of overtime because she thoroughly introduced me to how the whole company worked. She had a huge storage facility, a store, and two trucks, one that I drove and a big one. I worked for her for like one year, and in that time, I knew every single thing about the company because she trusted me with also the dirty secrets. This later came in handy. This is where things took a huge turn. I found out that my girlfriend cheated on me with her ex, and as a result, I broke up with her instantly. It was an ugly situation, and after it went down, I called her mother and told her what was going on, and that I don't want to mix things with business, so I will still be there for work, even though I don't want to see her daughter again. She said everything is alright, but of course she sided with her daughter and I felt that she's mad at me because of the breakup. I went to work and acted as a professional should, took all the drama aside. However, soon after she singled me out and started looking for mistakes so she could discipline me. This had been going on for months and I realized she was just waiting for an excuse to fire me, but I wasn't going to give her that reason easily. She was upset that she couldn't find big mistakes and the small ones she often just made up were not enough to terminate me. So she came up with a plan. On the truck, we had a power generator, which provided a light and a power for laptop, a printer, and so on. It worked in two ways, with fuel when we were on the road and with a cable in case we were at the storage. But it was not made by a company. They just hired an electrician for that and he made an error. So we had to flip a switch all the time if we used it with a cable connection otherwise it would burn out. As I loaded the truck, she convinced a coworker to flip the switch back and after a few minutes, the lights were gone and I noticed something was wrong. It burned out of course, but I knew I didn't forget the switch because I had loaded the truck for an hour and it only took five minutes tops to burn out, so it couldn't have been me. She didn't even hear me out, she just started yelling and fired me on the spot 
and stated that she was going to pay the repairs out of my last salary, so don't expect any money from her. I didn't take that lightly, and I told her, I don't think you want to go this way with me, but she refused to listen. It took a few days for me to cool down, but I wanted to give her a last chance. I called her and told her even though I knew what was going on and that she did set me up, if I get my money, I will call it an end and we don't have to see each other again. She told me to buzz off, so I came up with a plan. First, because I knew that the store she had didn't have a bathroom which was illegal in my country, the shop assistants had an agreement with a restaurant on the opposite side to go there if they needed. I reported this to the authorities and the next day they closed the shop because of this violation and told her that she can't open up until they have a bathroom. She called me right away and asked me if I had anything to do with this. I laughed and told her, didn't I tell you that you don't want to go this way with me? And I hung up. I knew that we worked so much overtime that me and the other driver had so much overtime on the cards. It records how many hours you drive and how fast and when you stopped. So I called the authorities again and told them everything. They went and checked all the records and gave the company a brutal fine. She sent me text messages all day long after that. I replied, ain't done yet. Then silence. Few hours went by and my phone rang. She called and asked me if we can talk it over. She even said she had sent my last paycheck, but I shut her down immediately and told her, too late for that. Then I called the fire department and told them the wires that they had in the walls of the storage were outdated, which caused short circuits daily and that they only had two fire extinguishers for the whole place when they should have had like 12 to 15. On that very day, they had to close the storage as well, so she lost the last place where she could make money for months until they got everything up to date and renewed all of the wires, which cost a huge amount of money. Because of the fines she got from the different authorities, she couldn't afford these renovations, of course. Few months later, she filed for bankruptcy. I know, because my ex-girlfriend called me with, I hope you're happy, jerk. You made my family bankrupt. I never got my paycheck, but at that point, I didn't even care anymore. I was happy with the outcome. I hope you enjoyed my story. Support our channel by joining as a member today, and we'll give you a shout out in our next video. Or come watch this video next. You won't believe what Karen does in that one.